Welcome to this episode of Litigation Briefs, Media Shorts on Law and Courts. I'm Scott Dodson, a distinguished professor of law at UC Hastings College of the Law and the director of the Center for Litigation and Courts, which produces this series. Civil litigation in the United States is adversarial. Sometimes it is very adversarial, like War of the Roses adversarial. This adversarial system is by design. The zealous pressing of each litigant's arguments is consistent with American notions of self-reliance, independence, and incentives. There is also the belief that zealous adversarial representation will lead to a better framing of the case and the issues, and perhaps even to the right result. The discovery phase of a lawsuit fits uncomfortably within this adversarial system. If litigation is a poker game, then discovery is where you have to reveal your cards to the other players before the final bets. Your opponent can demand that you share your information about the case, and ordinar ordinarily you have to do so. That doesn't mean that discovery is not adversarial. Information is power, and so adversaries aggressively seek the other side's information while they equally aggressively try to keep their own information secret. So where did discovery come from? How does it work and what purposes does it serve? Here to help me with these questions is my guest, Diego Zambrano, Associate Professor of Law at Stanford Law School and the author of the article, Discovery as Regulation. Diego, welcome to the show. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Excited to talk about discovery and congratulations on the excellent start for the new Center for Litigation and Courts. Uh, I'm a big fan already. Thank you so much. Well, discovery in America is pretty unique, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, the legendary civil procedure scholar, Steve Subrin, once wrote a, a paper asking whether we were, quote, nuts in the US to embrace broad discovery. The United States uniquely relies on a system of broad discovery. It's the main mechanism by which private litigants can obtain information from the opposing party. And it makes sense that we have broad discovery because we rely on private litigation for, as a vehicle for statutory enforcement. So in areas like antitrust, securities, employment discrimination, environmental law, other countries rely on agencies or bureaucratic enforcement. We rely on private parties. And that means that we need to empower those private parties to get information. And that's what the discovery process is all about. Uh, but it is difficult to overstate how uniquely American this is. It, it's an integral part of our system, an integral part of due process, but other countries consider it anathema. You know, countries in continental Europe that rely on the civil law have a very narrow process that's completely supervised by the inquisitorial judge. The judge orders the production of specific documents, takes charge of the questioning, narrowly tailors the process. There isn't what we know as the broad pretrial exchange of documents and disclosures. Those inquisitorial systems don't allow depositions, for example. And I actually think depositions are a really good example that shine a light on this. So whenever you watch a movie about law in the US, you see a deposition. We think of it as integral to a civil case. But in France, questioning a witness is entirely a judicial task. It's part and parcel of what it means to be a judge. So French commentators have harsh criticism for the American practice of depositions. They criticize American lawyers traveling to Europe to conduct depositions. They see it as a, a usurpation uh, of the judiciary. I had French clients when I was in practice and they hated this idea of a deposition. But even outside the civil law world, in the common law world, the United Kingdom or, or Australia, Discovery also looks very different there. It can sometimes involve document productions like we see here, but it's typically limited by specific pleadings, short times to produce documents, and a smaller scope. So all of this means that, yes, we have a unique system. Discovery is very American. And that's why Subrin asked whether we were nuts. Now, I don't happen to agree that, with that statement, but uh, it's quite unique. Well, so if it's unique, where did our discovery come from? Yeah, it, it's, it's really the combination of three ingredients. So, and I'll, I'll talk about these three. So first is the equity tradition, starting with the English Court of Chancery. 
The, the second ingredient is the common law adversarialism, which you talked about uh, in the introduction. And finally, the belief by the drafters of the federal rules of 1938, especially Edson Sunderland, that more disclosure, more openness would lead to accurate litigation and a better system. So let me say a few things about these three ingredients. So first is equity. Discovery has a long history rooted in equity courts where flexibility was paramount. One of the distinctive features of equity was that the chancellor and, and later American judges could manage cases without the presence of a jury. The decision process did not boil down to a trial. It didn't culminate in the spectacle of a trial that we know of. Instead, there was a long pretrial process back and forth where the court would assemble a record. And that process was heavily inquisitorial. The, the chancellor or the masters or commissioners would develop this record, put the evidence together. They had interrogatories, et cetera, et cetera. So those equity courts developed all of these pretrial procedures that we now know of as discovery. Uh, for example, my, my colleague at Stanford, Amalia Kessler has written about depositions, right? Well, one of the main tools of modern discovery, I've already mentioned it twice, came out of equity in the 19th century. So equity developed a bunch of these tools that we now call discovery. When does that get imported into our modern system in 1938? where it gets fused with the second ingredient, the common law adversarialism, right? So instead of this long information exchange, the common law emphasized pleadings and trials. Trials were the ultimate information flushing event that would decide the whole case. But of course, the trial was heavily adversarial. The parties put together the arguments, the parties questioned the witnesses. Uh, it is not inquisitorial. There was no pre-trial discovery stage at common law. Partly because you had to wait till the jury was there, right? You don't want to be developing the case when the jury's not in front of you. Indeed, the, the whole point of a jury in medieval England was that you brought in informed members of the community who already knew the facts. So you didn't need discovery, okay? So common law gives us this tradition of cross-examinations, of adversarial discovery of information at trial. That gets combined with all these equity procedures that we talk about that are pre-trial, okay? And that culminates in, in also what Subrin called equity conquering the common law, because the discovery pre-trial process conquers the trial and ends up taking center stage. The final ingredient is when the fusion happened, 1938, many of the drafters of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure thought trials were expensive and unnecessary. They wanted to simplify the burdens of the common law trial by bringing in equities flexibility. So all of this comes together, uh, thanks to Edson Sunderland in 1938, we fuse equity with, with the common law, and we end up with all of these tools that we know of as modern discovery. That's uh, an excellent explanation of how we got it. Um, how how broad is our discovery? And, and what are some of the discovery tools that attorneys can use? Yeah, so the, the standard account is the, the system is extremely broad, right? You can get information, any information that is relevant regarding a non-privileged matter. And now it has to be proportional to the needs of the case. Uh, the, the main drafter of the rules that I mentioned earlier, Edson Sunderland, once said that the, the rules of 1938 authorized the parties to employ an almost unlimited discovery. What you really want is a comprehensive exchange of information led by the parties. So, so what are the tools? You have initial disclosures that were developed more recently in the 1990s. You have subpoenas, requests for documents, depositions, interrogatories. You can even have physical examinations or property inspections, requests for admissions, right? And all of this could be iterative, right? The parties can engage in information requests based on previous requests of information. So all of these are tools, right? RFPs, document requests, interrogatories, et cetera. Um, and all of that leads to a far reaching release of information. So uh, for example, if you're suing a company in tort because you think that you developed cancer due to their products, let's say asbestos, you know, a lot of cases dealing with asbestos, you can request in discovery probably thousands of documents. You're gonna know 
How was the product developed? What did the company know? When did they know it? Are there emails evidencing this? Are there written documented documents evidencing this? In the modern world, are there Slack messages? Are there other messages documenting this? And you're gonna get to depose the major players in the case. So all of that is broad scope, but I, I wanna also mention the limitations. You know, more recently in the last 20 years, both the, the advisory committee and courts have, have emphasized the concept of proportionality. This idea that the request for documents, the depositions, all of that should be proportional to the needs of the case. Right, so you have to consider how large is the case, right? What, what are the issues at stake? How important is this information to the case? How easy is it to get the information? If it's really expensive, maybe you shouldn't be able to access it. Not only that, the rules also have a bunch of tools to limit discovery, right? So there are protective orders under Rule 26C. Even if the information is relevant, even if it is proportional, a protective order means that you can make sure it's only revealed to the other party, that it doesn't see the light of day outside of the case. You know, if you care about trade secrets or uh, business, commercial information, you can get a protective order. You can also move to seal produced records. You can quash subpoenas if they're overbroad or, or unduly burdensome. You can designate matters as privilege or work product. Um, you can stipulate to keep information confidential. So all of that puts a limitation on the scope of discovery. Let's talk about the design of the breadth of discovery. What, what are some of the purposes behind the way our discovery system is designed? And let's start with the private purposes. What are the purposes of discovery for the parties? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really good the way you're phrasing it because we wanna distinguish between private and public purposes, right? Private benefits, are those that are going to accrue to the litigants, to the parties in the case, okay? Usually the plaintiff and the defendant. Public benefits are gonna to accrue to third parties, right? It could be the public, it could be the legal system more generally, or it could be the market. So as you mentioned, let's start with the private benefits. What do we think discovery is doing? So the, the kind of most straightforward purpose is accuracy. Right? And the idea is simple. The more information we have, the more likely it is that the decision maker, be it the judge or a jury, is going to be able to make an accurate decision. Right? Sunlight is the best disinfectant. If everyone reveals their cards, then we'll know who's right and wrong. Right? So that's easy, accuracy. Uh, there's a, a related purpose here, which I would call fairness. Right? The idea that a plaintiff should be able to access documents that are relevant to the case. The plaintiff should be able to know what happened if the defendant has that information, right? So if you're suing for employment discrimination, you should be able to, to depose the, the, the parties that potentially discriminated against you. You should be able to get the emails that maybe evince the discrimination. So part of what the discovery system is trying to do is give these plaintiffs the tools they need to make their case, right? To access the system to have a voice in our litigation system. Um, another kind of unrelated purpose here is the idea that the more information we have, the easier it is to facilitate settlement, right? So let's get all that information out. Let's get the parties to reveal their cards, like you said earlier in the introduction. If everyone comes out and says, here's the information I got, then you can just negotiate the case. You can negotiate a settlement. You don't have to continue litigating. You don't have to go to trial. If it's easier, if it's more efficient, if it's fairer for you to negotiate a settlement, we now know what happened in the case. This was a, a, a really important idea for, for Sunderland that I've mentioned a couple of times. One of the drafters, the main drafter of the discovery rules. He thought broad discovery would make trials narrower, sometimes even unnecessary if the parties could reach settlement. Uh, one other purpose that a lot of the, the drafters emphasized was the idea that discovery would reduce gamesmanship or surprises at trial, right? Trial should be about who has the most, the best case, right? Who's actually right, ultimately. We want to reach an accurate outcome. 
but we, saving evidence, saving witnesses for trial and bringing them unexpectedly is a surprise. That, that doesn't reach to an accurate, that, that doesn't promote an accurate outcome. So if we have discovery, if we force the parties to disclose everything they know early, we're not gonna have surprises. We're gonna be able to have a better case and a better outcome. So those I would say are the main private purposes of discovery. So then what are some of the public benefits of discovery? Yeah, there are, and, and I've argued in, in recent papers that I've written that there are a lot of public benefits that the system can have, right? The more that you get information out about, let's say mass torts or about uh, companies that are uh, shielding sexual harassment, the more the public can benefit, right? There's a lot of information there that companies are going to produce only because they might get sued. Okay, so discovery can force parties to reveal information that's valuable to society. It can expose wrongdoing. It can influence how companies behave. So recently, for instance, there's a lawsuit against Monsanto. It's all over the news right now over its herbicide called Roundup. The plaintiff's attorneys publicized hundreds of company emails that they obtained in the discovery that showed a potential link between Roundup and cancer, right? We might want that information to be out so that customers can decide whether they wanna buy that product or not. There are a lot of examples like that in the mass torts context where you have drugs that cause diseases and you, you know, the public has a right to that information. But also, as I mentioned, in employment discrimination or wage claims, right? If we find out that a, a company is not paying its employees, other employees can see that and then file a case, right? Sexual discrimination cases. There have been a, a lot of cases where um, plaintiffs have discovered in a lawsuit against the city that there was sexual harassment going on. And all of that became public only because discovery brought it out. Courts understand this and they've developed doctrines that allow information produced in discovery uh, to be public eventually. Right? Because they're, it's not inherently public. Most of the time it comes out at trial. But courts now understand that a lot of that information should be public. They've allowed release of information covering you know, Bill Cosby's history of sexual assault or, or police videos documenting the use of excessive force. Courts realize you know, this information should be out and it should be public. Um, I've also written about this in the, in the corporate context. Right, If a lawsuit forces a company to produce information, it can work like an audit. And that way shareholders can see, you know, is this a good CEO? Is, it, is this a good CFO? So a lot of uh, corporate executives end up being fired because of information that comes out in discovery. And there have been a lot of prominent cases where even if plaintiffs lose the case, right? There's a famous case against Disney where the plaintiffs were alleging a lot of corruption in the company. Plaintiffs lost the case. But the information that came out in discovery actually caused a revolution in corporate practices, in how the board was supervising corporate uh, executives, in how other companies were behaving. All of that because the information came out. And you know, one thing that we haven't mentioned that I want to make sure we do mention is that the controversial side of discovery is the cost. And so there, there's always a, a, a conflict here between typically corporate defendants and plaintiff's attorneys. Corporate defendants, the Chamber of Commerce, criticize discovery because it's too costly, American discovery, right? The empirical data on this is noisy. We don't have a lot of great data, but as far as we know, it's only a small minority of cases where discovery ends up being extremely expensive. Uh, maybe the complex cases that account for less than 5% of all federal cases. In the run of the mill federal case, litigants actually employ no discovery, right? Or very little. Sometimes settle, uh, cases settle immediately or in the early stages of discovery. Sometimes some cases don't even need much discovery. Uh, so the best data we have is that discovery may not be causing all of these costs that the Chamber of Commerce claims. But I think it's a live debate. And, and certainly there are arguments on both sides about this. Well, Diego, uh, thanks so much for being on the show and for helping us understand civil discovery. 
uh, happy to do so. And, and thanks for having me. And, and like I said, uh, really excited about the, the Center for Litigation and Courts. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to more interviews. This episode was produced by the Center for Litigation and Courts at UC Hastings College of the Law. If you enjoyed this episode of Litigation Briefs, I hope you'll tune into future episodes. In fact, I hope you'll consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and audio podcast, which can be accessed through the Center for Litigation and Courts website at sites.ucastings.edu slash CLC. While you're at it, encourage a friend to do the same. This is Litigation Briefs, respectfully submitted, Scott Dodson. <laughs>